Well, welcome to another Friday night. This is actually kind of a memorable day to me. This is the last time I'm going to be filming a talk in Winnipeg at the church that has allowed us to use this beautiful facility. And uh, then I'll be heading off to Ontario. So I thought I'd do something a bit different tonight, just because for Kim and I, this is the end of a 32-year stay. It's the end of an era um, of our time here in Winnipeg. And so I thought I'd just share some helpful quotes that I've come across. And if you've been around Finding Freedom for a long time, you know that I collect them and like to share them once in a while. And, and they're just these little golden nuggets of truth. But let me start out with something that maybe is just a little bit more humorous. And I don't know if you can see it, but I'll read it to you. So it says... When one door closes and another door opens, you're probably in prison. To me, drink responsibly means don't spill it. Age 60 might be the new 40, but 9 p.m. is the new midnight. It's the start of a brand new day and I'm off like a herd of turtles. The older I get, the earlier it gets late. When I say the other day, I could be referring to any time between yesterday and 15 years ago. I remember being able to get up without making sound effects. I had my patience tested. I'm negative. Remember, if you lose a sock in the drawer, in the dryer, it comes back as a Tupperware lid that doesn't fit any of your containers. If you're sitting in public and a stranger takes the seat next to you, just stare straight ahead and say, did you bring the money? When you ask me what I'm doing today and I say nothing, it does not mean I am free. It means I am doing nothing. I finally got eight hours of sleep. It took me three days, but whatever. I run like the winded. I hate when a couple argues in public and I miss the beginning and didn't know whose side I'm on. When someone asks what I did over the weekend, I squint and say, why, what did you hear? When you do squats, are your knees supposed to sound like a goat chewing on an aluminum can stuffed with salary? I don't mean to interrupt people. I just randomly remember things and get really excited. When I ask for directions, please don't use words like east. Don't bother walking a mile in my shoes. That would be boring. Spend 30 seconds in my head. That'll freak you right out. Sometimes someone unexpected comes into your life out of nowhere, makes your heart race, and changes you forever. We call those people cops. Final one. My luck is like a ball guy who just won a comb. This is another cute one, two cats. One says, is your human a rescue too? The other, yes, she's got some issues, but we're, we're working through them. Another cute one. People talking about having an inner child. I don't. I have an inner older lady who says inappropriate things, tells everyone to be quiet, and wants to go to bed at 8 p.m. I'm sensing you may still have some boundary issues. The new serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the people I cannot change, which is pretty much everyone, since I'm clearly not you, God, and at least not the last time I checked. And while you're at it, God, please give me the courage to change what I need to change about myself, which is frankly a lot, since once again, I'm not you, which means I'm not perfect. It's better for me to focus on changing myself than to worry about changing other people, who, as you no doubt, Remember me saying, I can't change anyway. Finally, give me the wisdom to just shut up whenever I think that I'm clearly smarter than anyone else in the room, that no one else knows what they're talking about except me, or that I alone have all the answers. Basically, God grant me wisdom. And the... Another cute one. When God put a calling on your life, he already factored in your stupidity. Most comfortable, comforting thing I've ever heard. Okay, so let's move to some addiction, re recovery, trauma recovery. 
Addiction is giving up everything for one thing. Recovery is giving up one thing for everything. I thought that was beautiful. My addiction affected everyone around me. I'm going to make sure my recovery does the same. And then, what am I supposed to do with all of this? What our clients say when we have emotions weak. Cannabis isn't a gateway drug. Alcohol isn't a gateway drug. Nicotine isn't a gateway drug. Caffeine isn't a gateway drug. Trauma is the gateway. Childhood abuse is the gateway. Molestation is the gateway. Neglect is the gateway. Drug abuse, violent behavior, hypersexuality, and self-harm are often symptoms, not the cause, of much bigger issues. And it almost always stems from a childhood filled with trauma, absent parents, and an abusive family. But most people are too busy laughing at the homeless and drug addicts to realize that your own children could be in their shoes in 15 years. Trauma in a person decontextualized over time looks like personality. Trauma in a family decontextualized over time looks like family traits. Trauma in a people decontextualized over time looks like culture. I thought that was very insightful. Strength doesn't come from what you can do, but from overcoming what you once thought you couldn't do. And I love this one. There's many trauma clients that I deal with. They come into treatment after all of the storms and still standing. People brag about their drinking skills like it's something impressive. Want to impress me? Try not drinking, sitting with your feelings and improving your life. Don't wait for things to get easier, simpler, better. Life will always be complicated. Learn to be happy right now. Otherwise, you'll run out of time. And I love this one. If you quit now, you'll end up right back where you first began. And when you first began, you were desperate to be right where you are now. So keep going. Sometimes the hardest thing and the right thing are the same. So true. And this one I love. So people wanting pills and surgery versus people that want to change their lifestyle. Tons of people want a magic fix. Very few want to change how they live. And don't we know it in our profession? You wake up every morning to fight the same demons that left you so tired the night before. And that, my love, is bravery. The habits you created to survive will no longer serve you when it's time to thrive. Get out of survival mode. New habits, new life. You don't always have to be strong. Sometimes you need to scream, cuss, throw shit, and have a really good cry. But you always, always, always need to pull yourself back together. Then go back to being the badass you were meant to be. You become what you feed your mind. Drama, bad news, negativity versus discipline, positivity, dreams. Healing is weird. Some days you're okay and you're doing just fine. Other days it still hurts like it's fresh. It's a process with no definite time frame. You just have to keep going and know that when it's all is said and done, you're going to be okay. View your life with kind sight. Stop beating yourself up about things from your past. Instead of slapping your forehead and asking, what was I thinking? Breathe and ask yourself the kinder question. What was I learning? And this one from Carl Jung. Know all the theories, master all the techniques, but as you touch a human soul, be just another human soul. Nobody tells you this, but getting into alignment with your inner being can sometimes feel like baptizing a cat. 
My entire life can be described in one sentence. It didn't go as planned, and that's okay. And this is such a helpful diagram. I still have a long way to go, but I'm already so far from where I used to be, and I'm proud of that. Instead of beating yourself up for not being far enough, be proud of how far you've come. Healing cannot begin until the numbing of pain comes to an end. You have to let yourself feel in order to heal from the hurt. Sometimes the smallest step in the right direction ends up being the biggest step of your life. Tiptoe if you must, but take the step. The first step to getting anywhere is deciding you are not willing to stay where you are. So true. And then two ladders to emphasize the importance of smaller steps. Your speed doesn't matter. Forward is forward. We delight in the beauty of a butterfly, but rarely admit the changes it has gone through to achieve that beauty. The amount of dying to self, to the old life. Just for the record, darling, not all positive change feels positive in the beginning. I love that. Everything in your life is a reflection of a choice you have made. If you want a different result, make a different choice. No matter what the situation, remind yourself, I have a choice. We may not choose our circumstances, but we do get to choose our attitude and response. Marriage is hard. Obesity is hard. Life will never be easy. It will always be hard, but we can choose our heart. Choose wisely. One of the greatest challenges in creating a joyful, peaceful, and abundant life is taking responsibility for what you do and how you do it. As long as you can blame someone else, be angry with someone else, point the finger at someone else, you are not taking responsibility for your life. The first place we lose the battle is in our thinking. If you think it's permanent, then it's permanent. If you think you've reached your limits, then you have. If you think you've never get well, then you won't. It, you have to change your thinking. You need to see everything that's holding you back, every obstacle, every li limitation is only temporary. Ten years from now, make sure you can say that you're living a life you chose, not one you settled for. They asked her, can time heal you? She answered, you are the key to your healing, not time. Hurt, trauma, and dense conditioning will continue sitting in your mind, impacting your emotions and behavior until you go inward. What heals is self-love, learning to let go, self-awareness, and building new habits. A part of healing is acknowledging what you didn't receive in the past, and deciding to give it all and more to yourself now. Popcorn is prepared in the same pot, in the same heat, in the same oil, and yet the kernels do not all pop at the same time. So don't compare yourself to others. Your turn to pop will come. My mission in life is not merely to survive, but to thrive. And to do so with some passion, some compassion, some humor, and some style. The, little, the broken little girl still lives inside of me. She was left behind by everyone, suspended in time on the exact day her childhood was torn away, waiting for a warrior to rise from the ashes. 
I no longer try to silence her. Instead, I comfort her. I tell her how strong and smart she is. I tell her all the things she desperately wanted to hear all those years. Be kind to past versions of yourself that didn't know the things you now know. You have been criticizing yourself for years and it hasn't worked. Try approving of yourself and see what happens. Love yourself a little extra right now. You're evolving, learning, healing, growing, and discovering yourself all at once. It's about to get magical for you. I love this one. You are rich when you are content and happy with what you have. True love isn't found, it's built. If you let someone close enough to love you, they are going to hurt you. It is inevitable. That's what humans do. We hurt those we love, either because of ignorance, carelessness, or the unhealthy coping mechanisms we developed in our formative years. If we care enough, we try not to hurt them the same way ever again. That's a big part of what it means to love someone, to care enough that you make an effort never to hurt them in the same way twice. As children develop, their brains mirror their parents' brain. In other words, the parents' own growth and development, or lack of those, impact the child's brain. As parents become more aware and emotionally healthy, their children reap the rewards and move toward health as well. So profound. When you worry about your children, please know this. The most powerful way to help them is to keep working on yourself. The most precious inheritance parents can leave their children is their own happiness. These words have never been more true. So often, children are punished for being human. They are not allowed to have grumpy moods, bad days, disrespectful tones, or bad attitudes. Yet, we adults have them all the time. None of us are perfect. We must stop holding our children to a higher standard of perfection than we can attain ourselves. Ripples. When you create a difference in someone's life, you not only impact, impact their life, you impact everyone influenced by them throughout their entire lifetime. No act is ever too small. One by one, this is how to make an ocean rise. I literally have to remind myself all the time that being afraid of things going wrong isn't the way to make things go right. Living with anxiety is like being followed by a voice. It knows all your insecurities and uses them against you. It gets to the point when it's the loudest voice in the room, the only one you can hear. Now, every time I witness a strong person, I want to know, what dark did you conquer in your story? Mountains do not rise without earthquakes. Your relationship with yourself sets the tone for every other relationship you have. When your brain can't figure out where a problem stems from, it decides the problem is you. And it turns to negative self-talk. It falsely believes if you are the problem, that's easy to fix. So the negative self-talk can become relentless as your brain tries to get you to solve the problem. The real solution is found when you use the power of your mind to recognize this is a faulty brain function and correct the distorted belief. Just in case your mind is playing tricks on you today, you matter. You are needed. You are wanted. You are loved. You are worthy of beautiful happenings. Your smile is a gift to this world, and you get to start afresh again today. Some people need to be told they are worthy, that they are loved, not because nobody ever told them before, but because someone told them they weren't. 
When someone tries to trigger you by insulting you or by doing or saying something that irritates you, take a deep breath and switch off your ego. Remember that if you are easily offended, you are easily manipulated. And here's somebody begging for someone to love them, but the walls I built due to emotional trauma that I won't take down for anyone. So they prevent the very thing they want. Narcissists always see themselves as victims, no matter how terribly they've treated someone else. To them, the problem is not their lying, cheating, stealing, and abuse. The problem is that you started to notice those things. Don't give fourth and fifth chances for people to keep hurting you like they did in the first, second, and third time. Be forgiving, but not stupid. These aren't mistakes. This is true behavior. Don't feel guilty for walking away from destructive behavior. Often people that criticize your life are usually the same people that don't know the price you paid to get where you are today. Never beg anyone to be in your life if you text, call, visit, and still get ignored, walk away. It's called self-respect. When someone treats you like a side dish, take yourself off the menu. When a toxic person can no longer control you, they will try to control how others see you. The misinformation will feel unfair, but stay above it, trusting that other people will eventually see the truth just like you did. If you can't figure out how to be kind, figure out how to be quiet. The reason that people maintain their hate for years upon years instead of resolving it is that if the hate is gone, all they are left with is the pain that their hate covered up. One minute of anger weakens the immune system for for four to five hours. One minute of laughter boosts the immune system for 24 hours. The very worst part about grief is that you can't control it. The best we can do is to let ourselves feel it when it comes and let go when we can. Feeling the need to be busy all the time is a trauma response and fear-based distraction from what you'd be forced to acknowledge and feel if you slowed down. When you stop expecting people to be perfect, you can like them for who they are. Feel the feeling, but don't become the emotion. Witness it. Allow it. Release it. Many trauma survivors hold their breath and their bodies tightly, bracing themselves for whatever is coming next. Staying alert for years takes a toll. Create spaces where you can take your armor off. The expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not be touched by it is an unreal, as unrealistic as expecting to be able to walk through water without getting wet. That one's so good for those involved in helping people with trauma. It's funny how we outgrow what we once thought we couldn't live without, and then we fall in love with what we didn't even know we wanted. Life keeps leading us on journeys we would never go on if it were up to us. Don't be afraid. Have faith. Find the lessons. Trust the journey. I pray you heal from things no one ever apologized for. If you don't love yourself, you will always be chasing after people who don't love you either. Well, I hope you found those helpful. I just find when you come across a nugget of truth, you just want to share it with others and, and just hope it helps them as well. Well, that's the end of part one. We're going to take a short break and then I'm going to come back in a minute and we'll do part two, which is the Christian part. If you're not interested in that, that's fine. No offense taken here. You're free to go. Everybody else will see you in a minute.
Well, welcome back. We're looking at the life of Peter, one of the followers of Jesus, and we come today to the resurrection of Jesus. But I want to put it in context as the writers present it to show kind of Peter and how he responded in the midst of that time. Let me give you two scenarios that you may have encountered. I don't know if you've ever had the fact where you told your spouse or your kids some fact, something they need to learn, and you've told them over and over again. And then what, they never seem to get it. And then one day they come home and they, they're so excited because they just learned this new fact that they heard from their friend. And you go, that's what I've been telling them for months, for years. And why when they hear it from somebody else, all of a sudden it, they get it. Or what I see with clients all the time is they learn a whole bunch of truth, information, tools, self-awareness. And then they go out and use those tools and that information. It's very positive. But then one day they get triggered. And in that moment of being triggered, it's just like everything they learned just disappeared out of their brain. It's gone. They can't remember anything. And that's what I think was happening with Peter and the other followers of Jesus. So let me just read to you the, the account. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene, who was one of the followers, came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, who's John, the one that Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. So she thinks it's been stolen. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. But then Peter arrived and he barges inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there. Well, while the cloth that had been covering Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and, and he saw and he believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. So the whole point is, everybody that morning that sees the empty tomb doesn't even think the explanation is that Jesus rose from the dead. Now that is significant because we know that on three occasions, at least three occasions, Jesus specifically in clear language said, I will die, I will be crucified, and the third day I will rise again from the dead. Explicitly, and in the last couple weeks, that has happened. And then, on at least three other occasions, he's in more cryptic terminology, also told them that he would rise from the dead. So the point is, Jesus has repeatedly talked to them to prepare them for the fact he will rise from the dead, and they have not got it. It just went right through one ear and out another. And so when they get to the tomb that morning and don't see the body there, they don't think, oh, he res he's alive like he said. They go into panic. Now you can imagine the emotion of that. You're already grieving the loss of Jesus. And now you go to the tomb and his body's not there. And you think somebody's stolen it. Somebody's taken it and moved it somewhere else but hasn't told you. Maybe the disciples think maybe the women went to the wrong tomb. And so now what they're thinking is we lost Jesus. And now people are playing this horrible trick on us by stealing the body by misdirecting us, by moving it, whatever, how cruel. And so you're getting one bad thing added on another. I can't even imagine just how angry that would make people. But do you see that all of these emotions they're going through is because they haven't learned that Jesus is rising, has risen from the dead. They heard it, heard it, heard it but it didn't stick. And so we're told that Mary went, rushed back in a panic, 
told the disciples, Peter and John take off. They get there. John's younger guy in his teens, he gets there first, peeks in, doesn't go inside. Peter comes there, barges in. And the way that the linen, that so they wrap the entire body in linen and the head is wrapped separately in linen. And so the way it's positioned, they know that the body went through it. It wasn't unwrapped. And, and so they, all of a sudden when John sees this, he goes, the only explanation is Jesus risen from the dead. He's alive. He passed through the grave clothes. That's the only way to explain this. And he believes. But what is interesting to me is Peter sees the same evidence, but he's not quite believing it yet. It's going to take a little bit longer. So here's the observations I want to make. Lessons. Number one, it is a common human condition to not get important truths the first time we hear them or the second time or the third time. So don't beat yourself up if down the road and you realize you didn't get it but you heard it many times before. Just when you finally get it, be grateful that you get it. Secondly, some people get it faster than others. That doesn't mean the others are bad or stupid. It's just in some areas, some people get it faster than others. Accept your pace of growth. Accept your pace in beginning to get it. So we live in this place of recovery. And like Peter, we hear stuff, but it doesn't register. We go in to getting triggered and all kinds of painful emotions happen. And they're only painful because we didn't get it. If we had got it, we wouldn't have had those painful emotions. But it's the painful emotions that drive us into behaviors, seeking out the truth, and then we finally get it. Accept that process. It's not neat. It's messy. It's slow. It's frustrating. But that's being human. And I just hope you're able to accept that part of your growth journey. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for this part of the story that these people that followed you for three years, that heard you talk repeatedly about rising again, and they still didn't get it. And it just encourages us who so often feel like slow learners. And so I just pray you encourage each person here. Amen. Thank you again for being part of this Friday night with us. I'll see you next week, and I will be in another part of Canada.